Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. Andy, before we start, how are you feeling? I feel great. <laughs> really? <laughs> really. I think the big question is, Andy, are you rested enough to do this show? <laughs> oh, Pete. Oh, Pete. I don't, I, it's been a long time since we've done any sort of a cold open, but I feel like this actually <laughs> demands <laughs> demands it, especially to our Patreon listeners who get the show early, uh, that they're not getting it early and I feel like we need to to check in with your health to make sure that that they understand why that you're okay. I was worried about you, legit worried about you, Andy. Oh uh, yes, I know you were. I feel bad uh -huh. that I made you worry. Seven fifty six. It's when you wrote six fifty six my time, and yes. then I started writing you, and I, then I started quoting the movie, and I said things like oh. derp, and. <laughs> And then I told you I was going to get a few Girl Scout cookies to troll you because I know you're probably buried in them. And then it wasn't until almost 10 my time that you tell me, in fact, you fell asleep on me. You literally <laughs> fell asleep waiting for me. <laughs> yeah. That's, true. That's and, true. Well, to yeah. be fair. I wrote you, and you didn't start writing me back until a full hour later. Well, <laughs> so, yes, because I was eating dinner. I, plenty, I was eating. I had plenty of time. <laughs> and, uh, to drift off, yes. Yeah, you did. You literally drift off during that show. So I hope you're okay. 
because I, I am okay we, now. We're I early am, tonight yes. because it's before your bedtime. I think that's the thing. And what is it really <laughs> a sign that we're both getting older? We've been doing this show for a long time. <laughs> and it could have just as easily been me. me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The trailer uh, for this movie, Andy, um, you know, what do you say about the trailer? It pretty much tells the story of uh, of the this wackadoo um, 60s musical. Uh, we got a little bit of music. We got some nice Julie Andrews and uh, uh, Mary Tyler Moore. And uh, we, we get some uh, just a dose of uh, criminal underworld. I guess it gives you... A, a sense of what's going, what you're going to get out of the movie. You know, it, it, it shows the music, it shows the cast. Uh, it's obviously a much later, like it must've been a year later. Cause it's like, you know, a, you know, Oscar winner for uh, best music score uncut direct from its roadshow engagement. Right. So clearly it, it, it had been uh, doing that for a while. And I like the part now at popular prices, <laughs> which <laughs> was a great little bit to throw in there. It's, it, you know, it, um, it doesn't give really any sense of story. This is a, that era where it's just you're you're it's a musical. It's a 60s musical. It's got Julie Andrews and it's going to highlight like all the people and where you know them from and just kind of give you a sense of the good old times without really hinting at anything story wise other than, you know, just song and dance. Is the song and dance uh, of this particular musical enough to uh, to get your feet tapping? No, you know, the funny thing about it is I don't think they even feature some of the music that is what I think is some of the better songs. Yeah. Like they like Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. I'm like, yeah. that's that's what they are going to throw in here. Bizarre. I, I agree with you. This was uh, but it does set the stage for what ultimately is a wackadoo romp uh, through Julie Andrews and her journey to become a mod. Another sound of music, Chicago Tribune. A thoroughly delightful movie, says the New York Times. Four stars, highest rating. Julie Andrews is wonderful. New York Daily News. Julie Andrews in a wonderful gay comedy with music that spoofs the wild 20. What is your opinion of brute force, Mr. Green? Give them a young man they can trust. Tom Sawyer at 20. I never read Tom Sawyer. Was he sexy? Also starring Mary Tyler Moore, TV's Emmy Award-winning favorite. Operator, you have obviously never been in a Chinese opium den! This is The Next Reel, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that there is... Andy Nelson. Raspberries! (laughs) And we spoil movies tonight in the show... We've got number three in our series of great musicals of the 1960s with George Roy Hill's romp through flappers, bosoms, and white slavery in thoroughly modern Millie. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app or follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. And if you enjoy the show and are interested in supporting our ongoing work investigating great film, please consider a regular donation through our Patreon page. You'll get to join our back-channel conversations over on Discord, help us pick movies for upcoming series, and listen to the members-only weekend show, The Saturday Matinee, where we talk all sorts of things, including lists each week that relate to our current show. This next week, we're comparing lists of our favorite movies that take place in the 20s, but weren't shot in the 20s. So just head on over to patreon.com slash the next reel. Right on the old button, Miss Dillmount. That's swell. Just swell. Punctuality. The Pride of Princess. Andy, the thing about this movie is, I I guess I should open with the question, how do you feel about this movie now that you've seen the young girls of Rochefort? I just felt like this was just a really wild, silly romp. And I had, uh, for the most part, I had a really great time with it. Oh, yeah. The girls of Rochefort um, comparison, it's, you know, it's like. There's a lot of color and dancing and all that. Um, uh, I think this one just, uh, you know, it it had a a more uh, kind of a more musical structure that I was kind of expecting. Um, So I don't know. I mean, I I really enjoyed this one, though. Okay, then clearly we need to break down a case for why this movie is better than the young girls of Rochefort uh, and is ultimately telling the same story. (laughs) Okay. Okay, (laughs) we have two young girls. They are not siblings, but they are young girls and they are. Well, I'm saying they're young girls. They're in there. They're I'm going to say, what would you say? The young girls are wrote for their 20s in their 20s. Yeah. 
Yeah, 2021. Okay, I, I think we're in a similar place for these girls. Would you agree? Sure. They go. They they are eager to go to uh, the big city, to the new world, to this to kind of expand their horizons. Would you agree? Yes. There is a lot of horizon expanding. Uh, there is uh, a, a lot of music and dance as these girls look for uh, love. In in the case of Thoroughly Modern Millie, there is, I would say, a much more aggressive search for love and a whole different sort of model for uh, what quote modern love is. But there is a search for love. Uh, by these two girls who are uh, sort of partners in uh, this excursion. And lest we forget, the part that I had the biggest problem with, which was ultimately the smallest part of Rochefort, is a (laughs) full-fledged plot (laughs) in this movie, which is someone is selling young girls into white slavery. What is that plot element doing here? I don't know, but at least they actually flesh it out. That was a note that I had. It's like, I mean, I, I, it's an element of the film that's not necessarily successful for me. The whole idea of this, of this, uh, the the white slavery kidnapping plot through this, uh, you know, this uh, hotel for single girls. Um, it's, you're right. It, it's it's an interesting subplot. But what makes it work is that really it's integrated into the story right from the start. I mean, that's the first thing we see is the mysterious mm-hmm. feet as the as they're pushing this this kind of squeaky wicker cart to go kidnap this girl. We see the whole kidnap right out of the gate before it leads into the newspaper. Innocent girls sold into white slavery. Although I question how the press actually knows all of this, since as far as we know, they're all just kidnapped and disappear forever. But that beside the point, it's like that becomes a major element of the story as as we follow Millie at, on her quest for finding the perfect boss to work for who she can marry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's it's an element that's thoroughly throughout the story, if I can throw that word in here. You can. And that makes it work. I think it does. I think it does. And I don't know why you open with it's not successful for you. I think for the very reasons that you just outlined. No, 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 no. Oh, uh, lest we rewind. I'm not saying it's it's not successful. You said it's not successful for you. It's not as interesting. It's it's a part of the plot that, I mean, yes, it, it's successful in the sense of what it's doing in as far as uh, a weaving through the story. But I find um, it ends up being kind of my least uh, the the least interesting part of the story for me. That's the question I have. Why is that? Well, I think what happens is it ends up leading to a climax that I end up finding rather silly, and I, I feel like it unspools a bit as we get to the end of the whole whodunit uh, kidnapping plot of the story. And that's where, uh, because of that whole thing and the way that the the finale kind of unfolds, it ends up not working as well for me as I feel like it could have. Okay. See, I agree with you there. I feel like they wrote themselves into a bit of a box with this particular plot element. It's fun and frivolous and flamboyant and all those sorts of F words, uh, but it, it also runs its course. Uh, and and they end up having to do something that's m- much more sort of aggressively vaudevillian with the you know the blow darts and the you know the um, character who's paralyzed at the wheel and and it just sort of unravels. Now I think a lot of that is also the result of the fact that this movie is way too long for its own element. Uh, I uh, I still have a really good time uh, and and I think it works. A lot better, uh, as I said, than than Rochefort. It's a nice sort of uh, m- bit of icing to that experience, uh, because I think it's capitalizing on so many of the same sort of emotional beats, right? The color and the fun and the the m- sort of flamboyance of the of the experience of the period, uh, with uh, you know, but but it does so in a way that actually finishes the stories that it starts. I I didn't really have as much problem with the length. Um, which is funny because I, I my version seems to be like a really long version compared to other versions that I was looking at. It seems like the internet seems to say it's about two hours and fifteen minutes. Mine was a full two and a half hours. Yeah, mine was two twenty five. Yeah, mine's two thirty one. So I don't know which version I ended up with. Two thirty one. Yeah, it just it just uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, but I had a really good time with it, and not having ever seen it before, I thought that. 
Um, the direction was fun. I, I really kind of just loved George Roy Hill's style that he had throughout. Um, there was kind of this this madcap caper antics that I that they kind of threw in that felt very kind of silent twenties era. Kind of they were playing with. Um, paired with some just kind of fun 60s uh, vibe that it had sometimes. Um, I just love the cast. I, I thought that Julie Andrews uh, was brilliant paired with uh, John Gavin, who is uh, just a hoot in his in in his uh, ways. And James Fox, as you know, is probably the most wild I've seen James Fox. It was great to see. It, you know, it was just a really fun cast, a really fun group. And for the most part, I, I really had a great time with it. For me, there were just a few elements that kind of sunk it a little bit. And it was like we already said, the climax and stuff. And then there was just kind of like that, the random Jewish wedding song that was kind of thrown in. And I'm like, I I feel like this was just so tacked on, like they must have been trying to cater to a particular audience to, to throw that one in here. But for the most part, I had a really good time with it. No, I'm I'm with you. I certainly had a much better time than I did with uh, uh, with Rochefort. This is a great sort of growth. I I do like the the fourth wall breaking thing. You know, we made a note of that last time. It's definitely a, a thing that happens in '60s musicals. In this case, it was interesting that there was no direct conversation with the audience, as far as I can remember. It was all just stopping and looking, and occasionally punctuated with the the silent film um, title cards sort of explaining what might have well, been said. Am I remember- no, misremembering No, she never does something? talk to us, but you're. But I do think that they were doing it in that silent film way where when she is talking to us, it is through those silent cards, that those cue cards that pop up yeah. because it feels very much like she would have said it otherwise. Um, yeah, it's a thought exactly, bubble kind of a thing. Exactly, because there's that, yeah. there's that uh, great one where she's talking about, uh, you know, um, I wish my fronts weren't so full. They sure ruined the line of your beads. <laughs> and then the one with the, what a bizarre way to. Open. I know. I know. Uh, so it, it happens all through. And and um, it, but it's really I mean, it is quite the uh, the trend in the 60s musicals that and then just kind of the the, you know, the George Roy Hill threw in some fun things like there's a lot of little POV shots of whether it's our characters or sometimes when Jimmy's driving around his cars POV as he's driving uh, which was kind of strange. I, um, I also loved the way that they would play with the time transitions to do those little hidden cuts where you have her like go through a revolving door and then there's a masked cut as, as it just seems like she just comes right back out fully changed. Um, likewise, we have a great one when she's uh, she and Jimmy are making out in the car and he like brings her down in the front seat below the door frame where we can't see her and then the camera pans to the back of the car and she all of a sudden pops up and continues her conversation as then he pops up from the front seat it was just like strange little things like that that i mean they were clearly having a good time making this it was it was a, a joy interesting comment on her growth as a character and and this i i always find i i have to stop and reflect on this when i see this movie uh that her you know we we understand that she's on a journey of of growth and I don't know, maturing. Uh, and so she goes to the big city and she does it. But it's what's interesting is they use the opening like five minutes of the movie to do all of the practical montage stuff that would otherwise be the physical manifestation of that growth. So we see so much of her kind of growth that normally we might see over the course of the movie. We'd see her going to get the clothes and the shoes and the haircut, but they do it all really, really fast. So when we get her, Julie Andrews, the sort of Millie as this character that is going through the emotions here, um, we actually don't see like she's already sort of matured by the time Mary Tyler Moore enters the picture. I don't think she's matured. I think that she's she's become a mod is really kind of what she's been aiming to do. Right. Uh, and I right, don't think right. that's necessarily her. Uh, that's just the beginning of her arc. She's she's wanting to be kind of hip and cool because she shows up and she's totally like. You know, I, I not quite country mouse, uh, but definitely kind of, you know, the, the little meek church girl, you know, sort of thing. Um, and then she she and she puts on the trappings of the city mouse in the first. Right. Five she, she she pretty well, and I think she pretty much becomes the mod like she does everything that she needs to do to become kind of that modern 20s woman, even so, even so far as to, you know, she's she's been going to uh, study as a stenog. 
and uh, so that she can get a job and and uh, but she's a woman's equal even though she wants to just marry her boss etc cetera, etc cetera. i think that i mean what Weird. we learn right away is that um, she's looking, she has that mod plan in mind, right? She wants to be a modern woman, um, to, to get a job where she can end up marrying her boss. And that's kind of like her track. Um, and we see the start of that, but really her transition comes, uh, largely through Carol Channing's character as she's just like, you know, you got to follow your heart. You're right now. It's, it's almost like she's just following the money, uh, following kind of the, this path, that it seems like every girl should be following at the time. But really, when she learns to follow her heart, that leads her to Jimmy. So it's so there is that transition that she does take over the course of the film because she is following essentially the wrong path for the bulk of it. Right. But what I find so interesting about it, and I think this is just more of a question of efficiency of getting her character to the place where she needs to be to start her emotional journey, is the fact that normally the girl coming to the big city is the story of the film. And in fact, that's not Julie Andrews' story. Julie Andrews' story is she's coming to the big city and in the credits we see her major transformation, right? And the the young girl comes to the big city story is really told through Mary Tyler Moore's character, uh, and and instead we get we get to the position with Julie Andrews that or with Millie that she's much more of a you know now that she she is a mod and this is a story of her trying to to you know fill out the, check all the boxes on her plan and and I think that's what I find interesting that. Uh, it, it it subverts our expectation of what we get out of of Millie. The story it's the story of Millie, but it's not the story of of you know country mouse become comes to the big city, um, and and I think that's that's really great for me. I mean I I it, I I like that, and I like that it's told through George Roy Hill's kind of wackadoo sort of visual style. Yeah, it's definitely a, a fun story, and it's it, you know it's it's good that it's not such an expected story, right? I mean she's she's yeah, she yeah. just happens to be trying to you know looking for love in all the wrong places uh, so to speak um you know and and right. so to that end i think that they do a great job of setting it up quickly for us and introducing us to this world so that we can then see you know follow her on her journey of finding love at, at some point this journey of finding love actually takes them uh into a world war one uh airplane chase <laughs> <laughs> Right. I mean, I, I, I laugh at that. I think it's hysterical. I can't like I look at just at what would <laughs> what kind of circles would I have to write to to say, hey, you know where the next scene needs to take place? <laughs> it needs to take place in a biplane. Uh, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. But again, to your point, really surprising. Yeah, it, that was a really strange little moment with that whole like Red Baron sort of guy who is potentially chasing them. And it was it turns out that it's uh, I can't even remember his name, like Baron Schnitzer or something. Baron Baron Richter. <laughs> that was his name. Right. Richter, yeah, and, right. Uh, <laughs> Who's who's a friend of Muzzy's because, you know, she's she's friends with everybody. And it was it was a very fun little uh, gag that was just kind of one of those silly little things that just was thrown in just to add another level of silliness. And I think you get that, you know, constantly with Muzzy because um, she's go she's going from we we meet her in this biplane as she's flying with this this Red Baron type of guy. And then we meet this this uh creepy dance instructor of hers who's always going around yeah yeah and i just couldn't figure him out at all i'm sure it was some some tie to somebody in the 60s or something i, I couldn't quite figure it out and then there's you know she's doing her crazy cannon human cannonball you know performance routine with the the, the circus guys on stage it was always something and it was it made for just a, a just unexpected weird fun time was he was that dance instructor like not the spitting image of Matthew McConaughey? Ah, that's funny. I mean, could I you just I not just that, see but when him you said saying, that? All right, all yeah. right, <laughs> all right. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It's creepy. All right, yeah, all right. All right. Creepy, I, it's yeah. totally there. It's not. Uh, it's it's very strange. Uh, but uh, Carol Channing is the real standout uh, performance in this. And and again, you look at that sort of weird stunt casting so much better than gene kelly in rochefort well the, but the problem with gene kelly i don't think gene kelly was the problem i think gene kelly was fine in that film it's just it, he was put into a situation where it, it made for an awkward romance you've got this 20s you know 50s romance and they but which uh, which was written as something they were actually both looking for which made it even weirder um, this was just, you know, Carol Channing was this crazy old lady who 
actually ends up kind of tying into the story in a stronger way. So, so I definitely appreciated that. I, 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 I did too, because she took on the role of the mentor character, right? She was the matron of the story who actually prevent, presented the lesson that we had to learn uh, or that Millie had to learn in order to actually find real substantive, sustainable love. Like that is a, a major element in the story. And Carol, Carol Channing is an important uh, vessel for that. And, and that would have been, I, I can't look at this movie without comparing it to, um, you know, to Rochefort. And it's all proximity, but that would have been the character for Gene Kelly to play. That's what we needed out of his character. That's sure, what I'm saying. Sure, I, I see all that. I'm not 100% sure that I would agree saying that Carol Channing is the standout performance of this film. I mean, I think she was great in the film, but I mean, Julie Andrews, for me, especially coming off of uh, what we had just seen her in with Mary Poppins and then Sound of Music uh, between these two. And, of course, Torn Curtain uh, with Hitchcock. I mean, she had done quite a variety of films. And then this, I don't know, I just felt like she just captured like this amazing essence of this character. And not just not just the performance, the way that she did it, but she also seemed to really connect with the just the George Roy Hill's style and the cinema cinematic sense of it, the way that she would move with the camera and everything. It was like she really clicked. And and for me, this film really was hers. And um, it was I, I just thought she was fantastic in it. Oh, totally. And I hope I didn't imply that that I thought Carol Channing was the central standout character in this thing. I just thought she was the the stunt cast of, of this, sure. right? As the And I compare her to the Gene Kelly casting. I totally agree with you. And in fact, I think the way she played this character, Julie Andrews, uh, you know, blended so well with the with that kind of mid-Atlantic uh, presentation of all the other characters, right? That fake sort of almost British accent that we've talked about before. And Julie Andrews' sort of soft uh, Brit, uh, I think, really melded so beautifully with uh, with the rest of the cast, I think she she was fantastic, and and you're right. I mean, she's she really uh, uh, was sort of absorbed in the visual style of the film. She she just fit so perfectly uh, in in every scene. I it, you know it started for me. I just uh, as soon as she started tap dancing to make the elevator go up and down, I was really excited to to watch her in this movie or just i mean you know going back to the breaking of the fourth wall i mean just those first couple of times when she looks into the camera as she's i mean as kind of the the little church girl and she's looking around seeing all the hairstyles and stuff the short short bobs that all the women have and she just looks at the camera all confused and then she's got like these she keeps giving these looks and it's just it's so clever and just fun and she's she's definitely not afraid of the camera and it works really well in her favor here yeah what do you think of the the whole thread about the uh, the flat chested <laughs> women? It's really bizarre it, that that this is a <laughs> this is a thing we're we're really having to look at because the way they present it, the way she becomes a student of chest size. Uh, is is something that really forces us as members of the audience to become students of chest size, and that seems so backward to where we are right now. Uh, and, and but it, it is it, it's presented sort of so comically and and beautifully. And the uh, I I wonder I really wish I could have been a fly on the wall in some of the visual effects meetings. Um, you know how are they going to <laughs> actually cause? her chest to inflate like what are the like, that scene where her clearly her uh, undergarments are breaking i don't even know what kinds of stuff she's wearing yeah, at that point but something boy, breaks was she strapped and, in tight because <laughs> she right it was uh significant uh and and i it was i thought it was hoot i it was a it's a very strange way to to open this film but again it capitalizes on the, the just setting up this universe the world building like here's what you're going to expect and from here it is then not that much of a leap uh, for uh, her beau to decide that in order to get into the building where she's working, he's going to climb the exterior of a 20 story skyscraper uh, and and come and have a conversation with her on the ledge in a suit like that's just a normal thing. And I found that weird and strangely believable. <laughs> really? Well, he was a guy who what did he say? He's just like. I love driving on the wrong side of the road, don't you? <laughs> I 
He was always looking for firsts. And so it made sense. You know, he, that was part of his it's character. It's this comical, yeah, this comical sort of Gatsby thing going, you know, it was like, uh, and, and I, I really bought into it. I thought he was great. He's a weird guy to get used to. But I love his introduction to the film uh, through the tapioca dance. I make up all my own dance moves, which was yeah. perfect. And, and so I think with each uh, successive introduction of weird, through him, uh, we we actually are are sort of indoctrinated uh, further into the worldview, and and the craziness becomes something that's expected and not um, not shocking. Yeah, absolutely. And and they do a good job. I mean, just like um, young girls of Rochefort. I mean, they they do a good job of introducing the world of kind of the musical to us early on. I mean, young girls of Rochefort, you get that great dance that they do on the bridge as it's carrying the cars across here. You get that. I mean, and it ties so nicely in with the kidnapping uh, subplot because after the, the, the young girl has been kidnapped and she's in the wicker basket and you still just see the feet as the feet roll it into the elevator and then the elevator won't work. And then, you know, you learn about this whole thing where the elevator, you have to dance in the elevator basically (laughs) To get it to operate and so you see the kidnapper's feet as she starts like you know jumping up and down and kicking and then starting to do a little dance to, to get the elevator to work and it was it was a very comical way to kind of introduce us to the musical uh this thing was based on a play in uh, a, a british play called chrysanthemum in 1956 that i have never seen uh, have you? Had you I had never it? even heard of it. Um, it's uh, it, according to the Guide to Musical Theater. It says it's a melodrama in ragtime. Um, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't look like it was that big of a uh, of a play. It had. Uh, it played for a little while in London, and then it uh, shortly played in the U.S. But when it was adapted to become thoroughly modern Millie that kind of uh, killed the, the any, any movement that chrysanthemum was having. It kind of died. So yeah, probably rightfully. So I've never heard of chrysanthemum, never seen it. It's uh, it's one of those things that just sort of vanished in, in history. Let's do the deep scene. Dive, Let's do it. Uh, our scene is the is uh, the first meeting w- between uh, Millie and her uh, soon to be boss, and she has been uh, she's been out on the streets. She has been interviewing for jobs as a stenog, uh, and she has checked everyone off the list because all of the bosses that she's interviewed with are married or engaged, and or so other. she hasn't taken any of those jobs <laughs> or other. Yeah, exactly. That was charming. A pincher. And so here she is. She sees we get this beautiful crash zoom of the sincere trust building, and she goes in to meet with uh, Graydon, uh, and uh, and he yells through the door as she knocks on it, front and center, uh, and uh, that's when she meets him. Why'd you pick this scene, Andy? What's uh, how did it move you? This is just uh, aside from the fact that it uh, the scene uses the song uh, Babyface, which was a, a 20s song. Um, just a fantastic kind of 20s song, it, but they use it in such a fun way as she's totally falling for this guy. Um, and they use the song and they mix it with, uh, you know, the the hallelujah, which is just like such a strange, unexpected blend. Um, the camera work was fun. Julie Andrews was just top form with her, uh, you know, the way that she would be uh, agog staring at this man and just kind of like have to hold her, hold the door as her body kind of started dropping um, because she was just so, um, you know, lost in him. It's overwhelmed. Yeah, and just uh, and, was... and when it would cut to him, it was just those 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 just you know sexy shots with kind of the greasy lens look as she was looking yeah. at him with complete <laughs> lust. I mean, it, they just had so much fun making this scene, and you could just tell that this was uh, George Roy Hill really just kind of coming up with a fun way to uh, to kind of give this moment to Julie Andrews as she meets Trevor Graydon and totally falls for him and is convinced that this is the boss that I'm going to work for and marry. And uh, and it, it goes through the whole scene as she kind of uh, takes his dictation. And then as she runs out of the office to kind of do the dictation and write up the letter and everything. And it's just like it's just it's just that fun moment of kind of that romantic insanity as she's frantically trying to do everything. And it's just beautifully choreographed. It's just a really fun scene. And, and I think that it exemplifies a lot of what's going on in this film. 
Well, it is, you say, beautifully choreographed, particularly when she is doing her, uh, her, when she steps out of the office to do her thing, her stenog thing, uh, and she's typing and stamping and stapling and filing, and she's opening and closing drawers, and she's doing all of this uh, absolutely fluidly. She makes only one mistake, and it, that is where she stamps her hand with a rubber stamp, and we get that beautiful sort of, uh, uh, that, that beautiful, you know, mouth open um false pain kind of look in the camera it's really it's really cute it's kind of her superhero story like it's her showing off her skills because she's so confident she knows she's gonna she's gonna get this gig and it's also super subversive right i mean it's not like we usually it's the it's the other way around where the guy is looking at the beautiful woman with the greasy uh lens and and uh she's made the sexy one and and uh in this case uh, it, it is Trevor who is sort of the opposite of, as it turns out, as we learn, it's the, the opposite of what she really is looking for. She just doesn't even know it. Um, and and I, I, I love that. I love the way we are introduced uh, to him and, and how it makes her look so capable. Uh, and and Julie Andrews in this is this is, you know, one of those scenes to shine. She was she was a big star. Uh, as you've already mentioned. Yeah, I mean, this was, uh, she was number one box office star at the time. And so, uh, you know, she had, you know, starting with Mary Poppins, really a few years before, she just was making hit after hit. And uh, unfortunately, this was the last film of hers in the 60s that actually made any money. It wouldn't be until uh, 1974 when the Tamron CD came out that was, uh, she finally had another hit. But uh, boy, she was having a very successful run. And, and you can see why. I mean, she's just so good here. And, uh, you know, there's, you know, a lot of great moments throughout, but, um, it just, I don't know. She just, she takes it and runs with it and just plays this character just brilliantly. And John Gavin also, I think playing off of kind of that, that, um, that, you know, kind of romantic lead, uh, that you would expect in a, in a musical like this. I mean, he just, he's, he just, it's almost like you can tell that he's just hamming it up a little bit just to be, extra kind of that that romance novel sort of guy as as he's leaning back with his pipe in his hands with a smile on his face talking about his golf trophy and stuff i mean he just he's he's just just doing such a great job of being this character he's got a fascinating backstory i think i had only seen him in um psycho and spartacus um and uh yeah, I didn't really know much about him until I was looking into him here. I didn't know his his background. Like he has, um, I mean, he's he's like a you know very much a uh, uh, in the uh, Los Angelino uh, bloodline. I mean, he'd been uh, he'd been raised in L.A. from his family, but he was of Mexican, Chilean, and Spanish ancestry, and his his birth name is actually, which I would never have guessed, it's Juan Vincent Apoblasa. See, they should have left it that. That's very sexy. Juan Vincent. Up a blaza. What I found more interesting is <laughs> is he always seemed to be um, very into uh, politics and just being in organizations and stuff. And in the 60s, he became uh, a special advisor to the secretary general of this group that was called the Organization of American States, which he did for 12 years. Um, he did a lot of stuff with the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, he was just involved in a lot of stuff and a and, uh, lot of stuff with Mexico because of his heritage and stuff. What I thought was really interesting is that um, he actually almost became James Bond, which I. That is the highlight of his backstory yeah. for me. I don't care about any of that. Yeah, who stuff. cares that he became Mexican ambassador for Ronald Reagan? Nobody, nobody it was, cares. It was Go the James Bond. Bond thing that I think both of us <laughs> gravitated to. <laughs> he actually was signed to replace George Lazenby as James Bond in Diamonds Are Forever. But um, the producers uh, probably wisely decided to uh, push Sean Connery to reprise the role. Um, and they gave him a million dollars to do so, along with a million dollar uh, charitable contribution to, I'm guessing, a charity of his choice. Um, so that would have been the big moment for John Gavin, but it would have been so weird because he's American and it would have been such a strange choice to pick as Bond. There's no way that would have, there's no way that would have ever happened, but it's very curious that he was on the it show. It is list. very, very curious. Absolutely. 
he was terrific uh, in this movie. I mean, he was super fun in this movie. It's interesting because, you know, I think part of it, because the movie is so long, we actually get a lot more of him in the second half of the film. Um, you know, he, be, he really becomes a central character in The Caper uh, and uh, a, a really fun uh, sort of addition to that. If Assuming The Caper actually ends up working for you, uh, he, he's a fun contribution to it in his little bit of, of uh, you know, paralysis. I thought that was actually one of the more enjoyable parts of that whole bit. It was just yeah. so silly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, camera in this one, this is a, uh, obviously it's only two characters in this scene, but the camera is Russell Meddy uh, and uh, he was a uh, uh, busy, busy dude. Yeah, he had 172 uh, credits on IMDb. Um, and man, looking at some of the years that he was working, like he had some years that were insane. Like he did nine films in 1942. I mean, it was just crazy how much he was cranking out. We've talked about him before with uh, Touch of Evil and then also The Omega Man. So uh, so he's back uh, for yeah. the third uh, <laughs> film for us to talk about with him. Some some highs and lows. He definitely has some highs and lows. <laughs> Absolutely. But, you know, the work here, I mean, it's. I think it's... I, fairly standard musical work but it also fits with what george roy hill was really trying to capture with uh i guess what people call his nostalgia uh period he was he did four films that mm -hmm. kind of took place in earlier days um uh this uh butch cassidy and the sundance kid uh the great waldo pepper and the sting um and it has a look that feels slightly similar to those i think so i think some of that comes from george roy hill and just how he wanted to work with russell but even this scene, there was some really creative um, ways that they chose to kind of shoot things. Like, I loved the moment when um, uh, it's it's he it's, he's she's he is giving her his dictation and she's jotting it all down. And he comes and stands next to her and he does that stand again where his arm is up and his pipe is in his mouth and the camera's high and we're looking down at the tri through the triangle of his arm. And his uh, and his chin down at her face as she's just looking up at him with these amazing dreaming dreamy eyes, and it's just it was a fun little shot. And they there were a lot of these peppered throughout. Whereas it's like these guys are really doing a lot to spice things up here. Yeah, totally. And and uh, you know I think that coupled with the uh, the music in this choice, the, the beautiful choice of uh, of Babyface uh, in her kind of lilting voice. Uh, you know we never she never sings in the sequence. This is all in her head. Uh, but it, it is a, a wonderful composition. Uh, it, it's just a lot of fun. Yeah, I guess we should point that out. That that's a, that's an interesting element with this L as a musical, where oftentimes they're not actually singing the song on screen. It's like them singing, and then they're just. But it's it's just the music playing behind them, like the opening song, "Thoroughly Modern Millie." Right. It's a it's a montage yeah. piece, which I think is fascinating, um, and and I guess it. I guess it works. It it took me a while to get used to it because I was, you know, I compare this a lot to you know musicals like The Boyfriend, right, where it's a, it's a really sort of traditional kind of stage fair, and you don't get any montage things on stage, right? It, it's uh, generally somebody's singing, uh, and and so I, I, I it's hard to look at this and and see some of these great sequences, these beautiful sequences that are uh, you know not traditionally presented as musicals right exactly like yeah even i you don't get a lot of the the musical dancing sort of stuff i mean you do with like the tapioca right. but that's because they're doing a dance um but yeah a lot of times and you get some good tap in the you know they kind of use the elevator yeah. as a place to do some tap but but you're right i mean it's there and there's a lot of just sort of the the kind of running and movement choreography particularly you know we get into carol channing stuff um but yeah it is a non-traditional sort of musical. well and maybe that's because this is really um, it was never a stage musical first. You know, this was really a musical created. I mean, it was adapted from that other one, Chrysanthemum, that we mentioned. But it's mm -hmm. really is a it's a musical designed for screen. And so they're able to do stuff like that. And they're able to play with kind of yeah. those silent, yeah. you know, silent screen, the silent uh, text on the screen and and all of that sort of stuff in a way that, uh, you know, would have been a little more challenging in uh, in the uh, uh, if it was on stage. Uh, Jean-Louis does the gowns, and uh, my goodness, the gowns are fantastic. I think in, in general, the gowns are, are great on every character. The, the transformation into the gowns uh, are just lovely. Even great um, on Jimmy. <laughs> even great on Jimmy. You're so right. He was great. And uh, editing Stuart Gilmore, uh, the editing of, of this film. And uh, I, I think, again, you know, in, in 
partnership with the the composition, I think we get a a, a great thing. We've talked about him. I mean, he's he did the uh, Andromeda Strain, and and uh, yeah, the they uh, with kind of the the whole style, the way that they shot and everything. I think that that Stewart does a great job with the editing and just kind of keeping that that same pace. Um, likewise, I mean, the song Babyface, it's by Harry Axton, Benny Davis. It's a 1926 song, um, but Elmer Bernstein does the score for the film. And he actually does um, a lot of uh, taking of elements of songs like Babyface. Um, and then, of course, the the Hallelujah uh, song also and ties them together. And so as soon as she leaves the office and we're kind of done with the singing portion of the song and we get to the kind of the work montage portion of the song, it's his kind of frenetic reworking of the Babyface music into the score, blending the, the Hallelujah in and everything. And I think Bernstein does just an amazing job of of bringing all of these um, bits of music from you know across many decades together to create a really cohesive piece. What I don't understand, speaking specifically of the music, is the is where Bernstein ends and Andre Praven begins. Andre Praven's credited as scorer musical numbers, um, and he's an incredible talent. I mean, he's just a wonderful talent. And, and I also like him because I know him. I met the guy because uh, I went to college with his daughter, uh-huh. and that's cool. Uh, and, um, you know, he's he is fantastic. And, you know, he's been in the music department of uh, many, many, many fantastic uh, Porgy and Bess and Gigi and My Fair Lady. And I, I mean, he's just all over the place. Um, and I don't I don't know what score musical numbers means in the credits on this particular film, but uh, he, he certainly uh, deserves the uh, deserves some credit here in, in helping to mix some of these uh, well, and you very likely may be uh, pointing something out that um, I may have misspoken is, is it might not have been Elmer Bernstein who actually did the score for taking the babyface music and adapting it into that scene. That could have been Andre Praven and uh, Joseph Gershenson, the two guys who are doing all of that. Um, and then Elmer Bernstein was doing more of just the original scoring. Um, it's, it's yeah. an interesting blend when you start tying all these different people together in these, uh, in something that is normally would be one person doing it. It's, uh, yeah. Exactly. So. And one of them, yeah. right? I mean, it's just, they are normally, you know, stars in this element. And, and in, in fact that Bernstein actually was, was noted for his performance here, uh, to not be able to sort of credibly pull apart his contributions is, is tricky. Yeah, it really is. Regardless, they all did a great job because the music works really well. And it does feel, uh, whether it's a song that was written in the in 67 or a song written in 1919, they do a good job of yeah. blending it all together in a way that actually feels very cohesive. Let's talk then about the good man, uh, uh, GRH himself. I had, I think I had only seen... Um, the two other films that we talked about here, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and The Sting of his films. I don't think I had seen anything else. And uh, no, I take that back. Uh, unfortunately, I did see Funny Farm. Uh, that's <laughs> that is a sad you way to seen, end a career. <laughs> you never saw like, wait, OK, come on. We're talking about like Slaughterhouse Five or Slapshot. You haven't seen I haven't, those? I, I oh, know, dear. I have well, I immediately wrote you and I said, we have to get Waldo Pepper on here because that finishes out his sort of unofficial, you know, nostalgia yeah. series. Right. Uh, and so that's we, we got to find a way to do that. But he's got some other movies in here that I think we really need to talk about. World According to Dark. Uh, You've never seen World According to Dark? I Garden? don't think so. I think I always confuse that with Moscow and the Hudson. And that's the one I've seen. <laughs> What's weird is I think you're right. I do that too. Uh, and I've seen them both and that's very weird. <laughs> uh, uh yes, those are different movies and um we should do a series of those two movies together back to back. That would be a, tr- a real Just real treat. Them, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's uh that's a must. Anyway, uh, I actually I I find I like 
Uh, I like George Ray Hill a lot. I, I really do. I have so much fun. But of course, that's anchored by my opinion of uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid first and the Sting second. I'm, he's he's one of my very favorite, uh, you know, directors. I I feel so much of uh, of a personality when I watch his movies, even the serious movies. Um, you know, he's always doing something that is clever sleight of hand uh, in the the narrative or the visuals that I think really make for a, a better picture. And and it's just stamped. George Roy Hill. And, and uh, so I'm I am thrilled uh, with his uh, directorial uh, performance here. I think he's just uh, he, he's just a very clever director and, and a lot of fun. He does a great job here. Uh, he's got a very creative style. Um, he had worked with Julie Andrews just the year before on Hawaii, the a big uh, adaptation of Michener's novel. Um, and so I, I think that I haven't seen that. I don't imagine that that's very funny. I actually, doubt it's I very that. funny. Uh, I doubt that's very but, funny. But uh, I think it was also a musical. I'm not sure. But I know there's at least a song in it. Uh, I don't know. I'm curious about it. I'm actually... You know, I mean, Richard Harris. Oh, come I on. Know. Richard Harris and Julie Andrews. That's got and somebody Max singing Von in Sino, that Yeah, it's, it's, it's... Yeah. <laughs> it's, and Gene Hackman, you know. <laughs> it's... It, you see Max von Sydow, you think comic stylings of 1966. That's what exactly. you're looking at right there. Exactly. Mm-hmm. No, it's... Uh, yeah. I... Uh... <laughs> I'm curious about that one. I, uh, I, you know, I don't know. I guess what I, I'm saying is with George Roy Hill, I find that he's a director that every time I watch something of his, I really find myself attracted to what he's doing within it. Um, I haven't seen that many of his films, but the ones I've seen, except for Funny Farm, I do really like. And so it does make me want to investigate more of his work because I think that he has a, a solid body of work that I've seen so far. Uh, the other cast, there were a bunch of uh, folks in here that we've already mentioned that are uh, uh, that that turned out terrific work in this movie that weren't in the deep scene dive. And one of them, of course, Mary Tyler Moore. She was already um, she was already something of a, a, a star uh, in this movie. And she comes in as the or before this movie. And she comes in here as the ingenue. Yeah, she had. Uh, when was the her show? I mean, it was going on. Uh, she was on the Dick Van Dyke show. Right. And mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. think uh, that was going on right before this. I don't think she had her own show until uh, a few years after this. But she was one of those people who was just such a like a, a TV standard that seeing her in this, I, I mean, she was just she was really funny. And I liked this kind of, uh, yeah. uh, I, I, I don't know, I never quite understood her because she was like an orphan, but clearly had money. Enough to always yeah. expect people to be waiting on her and writing everything with checks. And it was it was a very strange character. And and by the time we get to the end and learn that she's actually Jimmy's you know, long lost sister and that uh, they're that Muzzy's their, uh, I guess, their stepmom, I think. Is that right? <laughs> I, I got a little confused there at the end. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's a yeah, lot there's, of there's a lot going on at that a lot party. Of things happening. But it was just, it, you know, I, I don't know. I It was one of those elements that I never quite completely bought how that tied up so neatly at the end but i still really enjoyed mary tyler moore in it it's hard not to love mary tyler moore in this thing she was you know just to get the dates right she had been on the dick van dyke show from 61 to 66 uh and so she was a staple as laura pitry in in that uh but she started on television in 1952 uh in ozzy and harriet uh, as happy hot point uh, but she was also in uh, in some other you know reasonably long running shows or s- first seasons uh, through uh, all the way through that. This was part of the momentum that led to uh, you know Rhoda and the Mary Tyler Moore show and just sort of staple as uh, comedian uh, who's just you know part of American TV comedy history. You know she's really funny in ordinary people she's a riot she's a laugh <laughs> riot if you don't laugh at that there is you're wired wrong <laughs> oh <laughs> she's also you know the uh the uh, hit uh, 1988 comedy uh lincoln she played mary todd lincoln <laughs> that was a that was a, a real comic anchor for her career yeah. too it was she's amazing she is <laughs> <laughs> James Fox. You know what's funny about James Fox is is he's one of those faces that I've always known. Like he just has popped up in so many things. Um, and looking through his uh, his filmography, I'm like, 
Um, it, I think a lot of it comes from like the remains of the day era. Um, James Fox, where he's mm-hmm. kind of that older, staunch British guy, and he's just so serious. Yeah. And so seeing him here, oh, and then also I mix him up with his brother sometimes, Edward Fox, who's in uh, The Day of the Jackal, and who's fantastic in oh, that right. film. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, but I, I think that in this uh, in this film, I was just, I was completely taken aback by him here because he was so vibrant and alive. And I'm like, this this is James Fox? This is that guy from The Remains of the Day? It it blew my mind. He was just he was so fun. It's just great. He is he's fantastic. I have a hard time reading the credits because all I see is Jamie Fox as Jimmy Smits, and that would be an awesome movie. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious! I thought it was interesting looking yeah. at his career that he actually he left acting for nine years. Um, he felt he was in the movie uh, Mick Jagger's movie performance in 1970, and. Uh, it says a combination of his father's recent dr- recent death, the strain of filming, and smoking the hallucinogen DMT with Mick Jagger led to a nervous breakdown. He subsequently joined a religious organization known as the Navigators, which is similar to the Gideons and is closely asso- associated with the ministry of Billy Graham. So I thought that was an interesting little thing to learn about him. <laughs> you know, everybody's path is different. Everybody's Andy. path is different. Yes, indeed. Mm-hmm. Did we mention Carol Channing is in it? Raspberries. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite line of hers was actually not raspberries. It was, do the bunch of you promise to succumb wholeheartedly to the merriment? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. She's so exuberant. She's uh, she's really great. But the highlight for me is when she's actually on stage with the, <laughs> the acrobats. <laughs> right. Oh. Is that brilliant and out of freaking nowhere? Out of nowhere, but of course she would be shot out of a cannon. Like, of course. It, of it course. It was so strange. And plus the whole setup of, ooh, the cannon, it's the bad guys. They're going to they're gonna shoot it at, at Mary Tyler Moore and <laughs> Julie yeah. Andrews. Oh, no. It's really just muzzy. It was, it was like this weird, almost nonsensical setup to this just completely absurd scene that was just really fun. I had a great time with that. Me too. I had a blast. I, I and every time she was on, on stage. But again, the movie has done a, such an admirable job of setting up the wackiness that by the time we get her, she just is. It's you know, stick your feet in the cement. It, it you're really you're stuck. Uh, she's great. The the only thing that of course s- strikes me sideways, given the benefit of history, uh, is uh, as we mentioned, Jack Sue and Pat Morita are cast as Orientals one and two, uh, and, and they are the Chinese. Uh, laundry service kidnappers, uh, and they performed the role that they intended to, or they were intended to perform. You know, what was disappointing about that is I actually didn't find their parts as offensive as I was expecting, knowing that they were called Oriental 1 and 2. Um, I actually really enjoyed the performances of Jack Sue and Pat Morita. I yeah. thought they had a lot of fun with the parts. They they you know just made it their own and and did a good job with it. What what ended up kind of disappointing me in in retrospect was when you get to the end and you realize okay they're credited as Oriental number one and Oriental number two, whereas the Oriental guy who is working for Muzzy, um, who has a much smaller part. He actually is given a name. His name is T. It still is kind of almost an offensive name, but still he's yeah. he's at least given a name. Why are these guys not given names? It just it almost diminished the fact that um, that they were in, important characters and they became nothing but uh, kind of tools for Mrs. Mears to to uh, get her plot into place. Yeah, exactly. That it was just disappointing, but it was uh, apropos of the time, and so you know, I'm trying to trying to be more forgiving. I can't. It, it in the same way I'm trying to be forgiven here. It, it, I'm still not forgiving uh, anything in uh, uh, you know that ridiculous red red. My farm's on fire. God, God with the wind. <laughs> you mean Atlanta's on fire? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Right. Right. <laughs> anyway, uh, Kavanda Humphrey is Miss Flannery and uh, Beatrice Lilly as Mrs. Mears. Uh, I, w- I want to hear Kavanda Humphrey say Avada Kedavra. 
<laughs> yeah. Cavetta <laughs> Humphreys of Atacadabra. Sounds like a show of her own. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, it was, uh, they, they were great. Uh, in, in particular, her, you know, we have a little bit of a lampoon chase where she's, uh, you know, strapped into the phone service or to the phone system and she has to run and chase the man who's walking through her, uh, you know, uh, her floor and she gets ripped back and thrown on the floor and then she's on the hunt with this wire hanging off her head and uh i, I think she's very funny uh funny stoic um as the head of the female staff uh in the company which again dated but charming uh and beatrice Lilly as mrs mears of course the head, uh, heading up the the kidnapping she speaks i, I couldn't tell is she uh was she somehow supposed to be chinese i didn't think so i thought that she was just kind of uh, you know, in that world. And so obviously learn Chinese to communicate with them. Although yeah. most of the time when she was speaking, it sounded like, you know, just a, you know, faux Chinese. It never sounded... Yeah. You never quite got the word. <laughs> it never sounded quite real. Yeah. Uh, interesting thing about, uh, about Beatrice Lilly. She was actually dubbed the funniest woman in the world. For how long? <laughs> it was just, it was one quick dubbing. For a, <laughs> 15 minutes. No, she's very funny. I could totally see that. Um, yeah, she and, had a style uh, that I thought I thought worked yeah. well. Um, yeah, this was uh, her her style. This was very much the end of her kind of that that era of her and just kind of her style after this film. It really kind of uh, faded. And uh, I guess by this point, she is actually uh, already starting to show some signs of Alzheimer's. And, uh, yeah, so it, it was in a decline shortly after this. I, I wonder, because the era makes me think of, you know, obviously we're handing off, essentially, from from women like Beatrice Lilly to Mary Tyler Moore. But, you know, where was um, Carol Burnett uh, in this, uh, you know, in, in sort of the lineup of uh, funniest women in the world? Uh, yeah, I, I think it was more of a theater right. thing rather than screen, because, yeah. I mean, she only had nine screen credits. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Interesting, interesting. And she's from Canada, so you know the Canadians and their oh, sense of humor. Oh so. well, Andy, no, that explains it. <laughs> explains, explains everything. <laughs> now, we, uh, this this thing after it absolutely decimated any uh, institutional memory of Chrysanthemum, uh, the movie comes out, and then after that, it goes back to stage. Is that right? It did, yes. Although it took a very long time, the stage musical um, didn't actually. Uh, happen until 2000 so it was a, it was quite a break for it to uh to actually uh turn into a stage show which um i i have a friend who was in it but i've never seen it so i uh, i really should check it out at some point i i mean I, I really enjoyed the movie i can only imagine that the musical kind of follows along the uh the same path uh, Kristen chenoweth i think actually was one of the people who uh first uh first popped up in it as millie I can totally see that. Yeah. I can totally Actually, see Actually, I'm that. looking at the cast now. It was Kristen Chenoweth, B. Arthur as Mrs. Mears. How fantastic yep. is that? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. Oh, uh, and then, uh, yeah, Ken Lung uh, as, uh, yep. as uh, oh, they gave him a name. Ching Ho and Bun Fu were the two oh. guys. <laughs> it's an interesting play that I think is still kind of, uh, you know, making its way. Uh, you know, it's, it's still out there. Um, so I... I don't know if it's ever played close to me. Have you ever seen it? I have not seen it, but you can listen to the um, the soundtrack uh, is available. The original Broadway cast uh, soundtrack uh, is uh, available in you know the places where music is available. Looking at it in Apple Music, and it's and so I've been listening to the movie uh, score, but the soundtrack of the Broadway cast. There's a lot of stuff in here. I, like for example, Babyface is not uh, is not in the musical i don't i don't um, think they use i i think it's actually mostly original songs i don't think yeah, that they yeah well actually, they do have jimmy and thoroughly modern millie the opening yeah. and so there there are some but those were ones that, that were written for, yeah those were ones written yeah, for the movie, for the movie. I, yeah they're not yeah. pulling out those one those songs from the 20s like the movie did exactly yeah. exactly uh so uh, you know it's interesting i i need to put this on and just get more acquainted with it um because it uh, the music is uh music is fun Super fun. Absolutely. How did it do an award season? 
Uh, this was a pretty popular movie. Um, it had seven Oscar nominations, um, and uh, the the uh, they were for best music. This is we were just talking about this best music original music score. Elmer Bernstein um, was nominated, and actually he won. This uh, was the only Oscar win for the film, and it was Elmer Bernstein's only Oscar win in his entire career. He had fourteen nominations, um, ranging from nineteen fifty five to two thousand two. Um, and this was the only time he ever won an Oscar, which just seems like a travesty. He's a, such a brilliant composer. But um, it, so that was the win for the film. The other nominations were Carol Channing was nominated for Best Supporting Actress, but lost to Estelle Parsons in Bonnie and Clyde. Um, it was nominated for mm-hmm. Best Art Direction Set Decoration and Best Costume Design and Best uh, Music Scoring of Music Adaptation or Treatment. Those all lost to Camelot. Uh, best sound lost it in the heat of the night and uh, best music original song for the song thoroughly modern Millie lost to get this talk to the animals in the movie Dr. Doolittle, <laughs> which I challenge you to sing a few uh, bars of that one. Oh, I don't know why you would challenge me to do that because uh, is, are you is that some sort of a threat? <laughs> do it. Do it. No, it, because I just of think course it's... you start singing it and you can't you can't stop singing it. That's I, my take on it. I don't even know the song. So what? I don't. I don't think I know the song. I, uh, uh, I guess Henry. that's maybe it speaks to the fact that the mo- the song might have survived the movie. But Doctor Doolittle was kind of classically known as one of the, you know the big bombs that nearly brought that studio down. But in a year that had the bare necessities from the Jungle Book and the Look of Love from the the terrible. Uh, Casino Royale adaptation. Um, it's just shocking to me that, a, a, and then Thoroughly Modern Millie, it's shocking that Talk to the Animals is the song that walked away with an award. Well, see, the thing about Talk to the Animals, though, that's interesting is that it was, it, you know, it, it was taken and done again in so many different, you know, ways. I mean, I think that the actual um, the, the sort of definitive version of Talk to the Animals might be Sammy Davis Jr. Like it, it's it's a movie or it's a, a, a song that absolutely outlived uh, and outpaced. I mean, Bing Crosby uh, did Talk to the Animals. Like, you know, what I mean, like Bobby Darren does Talk to the Animals. So like that was a, uh, a crazy, you know, popular song. I still think that it was the one that should not have won. That's all I'm saying. I don't think you've listened to it enough. I think that <laughs> I mean, I this is a challenge and you should listen to it. And then I dare you to get it out of your head. Like it's not. If you're, but if that's, if that's can you the speak bar rhinoceros, for... we'd say, of course, rhinoceros, of course, Andy, you have things like that I, in, in this song. If, uh, if, if that's the, if that's the, uh, the bar that we have to meet, I still would argue that the bare necessities is going to take it over that song. No, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to fight you on Bare Necessities. I love that song. I'm just saying Talk to the Animals is a big deal. Okay, I'm going to listen to it, and I'm going to see if I can get it out of my head. And I'm going to see if I think it's even worthy of having having won an Oscar. (laughs) Oh, it's totally worthy of having. Oh, it's totally. We're not going to. I mean, oh, yeah. No, we're not going to go down that. It's worthy. All right. It's worthy. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll check it out and see. Anyway. The movie did get five nominations. I feel like you're trolling a little bit. That's what I think you're doing a little bit. You're trolling me right now. I'm not. I just I I am not familiar with the song, mm-hmm. and you are, and you are you're defending it in ways that I wasn't expecting. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> which is fine. I I love that you love that song. Uh, maybe we should just leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That is a, yeah, that's a bow of defeat, and I'll take it. I didn't realize that it was your song. So <laughs> it's actually my song. That's right. I originated that song. Anyway. Anyway, All back right. to you the awards. Saying... Um, Golden Globes. It had five nominations, and uh, Carol Channing did win uh, for Best Supporting Actress. And at the WGA, it actually got an award for the Best Written American Musical, which was uh, a nice little thing to see. Yes, it is. It's a very, very nice thing to see. <laughs> how did do? <laughs> how did it do at the box office? Uh, well, George Roy Hill's big musical cost a cool $6 million to make, the same amount that Disney spent on Mary Poppins. In today's dollars, that's $43,260,000. Uh, 
The movie opened on June 14, 1967, opposite The Dirty Dozen, and went on to become the 10th highest grossing film of the year. It made $34.3 million domestically, which is $247.5 million in today's dollars, and $5.6 million internationally, which is about $41 million in today's dollars. That gives it a total gross of $288.4 million in today's dollars and adjusted profit per finished minute of $1.8 million. Considering it's nearly two and a half hours long, it's actually a fantastic take from the box office for Millie and her friends. There you go, Andy. I think this is a fun movie and and uh, funny. And even though I, I contend it was too long, uh, I do uh, think this was absolutely worth seeing and a worthy follow up to our 60s series musicals series. Oh, absolutely. I, I had so much more fun with this than I was expecting, I think. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure what I was expecting, but it actually was just a really vibrant um, just a silly musical that had almost kind of like that screwball nature at times. And um, I, I had just an incredible time watching it. Yes, there were some elements that that kind of dropped it a little bit for me, like the um, um, the aforementioned uh, the nonsense uh, song that she sings at the Jewish wedding, which, you know, I, I think it was it must have just been a thing happening because after Supercalifragilistic, it seemed like that was kind of a thing where where people started uh, putting these kind of nonsense uh, songs into the movies. You know, so I can see why it's in there. It's not my favorite thing, but um, it's still, you know, it's fine. Um, and then the ending where it kind of kind of falls apart a little bit. But on the whole, I had so much fun with this movie. It's definitely something I would watch again. Um, it's just, it's a, a really fun movie. Yeah, it's a real treat. And I think with that, Andy, we should rank it. Let's do it. Head on over to flickchart.com slash the next reel and you can catch up with our entire list of all the movies we've talked about on this very show. Or, of course, tap flickchart in your show notes uh, on your uh, digital podcasty device and it'll take you right there. And you can uh, add this movie to your list and see how it stacks up against ours. Andy? All right. First up, we have Thoroughly Modern Millie or Star Trek Beyond. <laughs> huh. Uh, it makes me sad because I, I want Millie to be high, but I I have to go with Star Trek Beyond. Yeah, I, I would. Okay, Desert Island. I know. TV and these two movies. I would watch Star Trek Beyond first, and I, I'm not crazy about that, but that's well, the way it is. We'll see how it rises. Thoroughly yeah. Modern Millie or Atlantic City. Millie for me. Yeah, I'd give it to Millie. Thoroughly Modern Millie or Princess Mononoke. Interesting. I'd, I'd um, probably give it to Mononoke. I would too. Uh, it's hard. I Yeah, this is really depressing. I feel like this is yeah. ending up way too low now. Uh, Thoroughly yeah. Modern Millie or Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. This one I will say Millie. Uh, I will give it to Millie, yeah. Thoroughly Modern Millie or Quarantine. Oh, geez, here I'm going to say Quarantine. Yeah, quarantine. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Uh, Thoroughly Modern Millie or Thief. Uh, Millie. Yeah, I'm going to say Millie. Thoroughly Modern Millie or David Fincher's The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo? I'm going to say Millie. Really? Yeah. Oh, I'm Dragon Tattoo. All, All right, right. Let's, let's do, do it. it. One, One, two, two three. three. Paper. Paper. Scissors. Rock. <laughs> <laughs> Thoroughly Modern <laughs> Millie. All right. Well, there it is. Thoroughly Modern Millie is 225 on our chart out of 339. Um, pretty low. Uh, that's like a 34%. I yeah. would put it much higher than that. I think that it just had some tough, uh, tough rankings that kind of pushed it down way down there. So tell me then, where did this land on your own personal flick chart? It could be the recency and the sheer joy I had watching it. Um, uh, it went pretty high. It ended up at 598 out wow. of uh, 39.19, which is about 85%. So it's up there. It is up there. Mine uh, ended up at 333 out of 1,009. I clearly need to be doing more, uh, getting all these movies in here. I'm, I'm just feeling so inferior <laughs> when you do your thing. 3,000, that's, man. You, yeah. 3,900, it's 30, almost 4,000. Almost 4,000, Andy. I don't know if you should be proud or ashamed of that, but I will tell you <laughs> that uh, I ended up at 333 out of 1,009, and that's a 67%, and I'll tell you, it ran into some things just that I could not 
uh, in good conscience, let it uh, let it slide. And but I feel stronger about this movie than the ranking would show. I, I had much more fun with it. it. It should be, according to the algorithm, it should be a three and a half star. I'm going to give it a four and a heart uh, on this. And that five star, uh, it's missing that five star just because it's long. I think there's it, it's um, I don't know. It's just just it's just long. Yeah, I, I didn't have a problem with the length. It was just a few of the story elements. Um, but uh, man, did I have fun with this. And I'm glad it's been introduced to me because this is one that I, I certainly would look forward to watching again. Yep. It was a four. Yeah, four star and a heart for me as well. Yep, absolutely. And uh, that's where you'll find it on letterbox.com slash the next reel. Uh, and uh, hey, did you see you, you don't you're not an iPad guy, are you? Uh, I you don't have an iPad. Yeah. Do you have an iPad? I, I have one. No, Letterbox. Our friends over at Letterbox just released a big update on their app, and now it's they have a native uh, iPad version of their Letterbox app, so you can do all your ranking and diarying. Your diary. <laughs> Di- <laughs> That's maybe Diar- find a different way to say that. Hang <laughs> <laughs> uh, on your iPad natively now. It's really quite beautiful. So congratulations, guys. No good stuff um i I, so that's the end of number three in our 60s musicals series uh where do we go from here andy we're going to be ending it next week with william wyler's 1968 film funny girl starring barbara streisand and omar sharif babs oh babs i'm excited about this one i'm very excited to watch this movie with you you haven't seen this one either that is correct oh it's a doozy this is a doozy for andy Another long one, too. Can't wait for you to see. There's a whole white slavery subplot in this one, too. It's amazing. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I guess I'll find out. <laughs> uh, this has been a, a lot of fun. Everybody, thanks for putting up with us during this, uh, this particular uh, series. Uh, it's a lot of fun for us. This show would not happen without the hard work of Stephen Smart, who runs the Instagram program over there, all the way from Scotland. And Ben Steerick is helping him over there. Uh, ben Lott uh, runs all things on Twitter and the Blot Spot on our Discord community, and the next real theme, Ragtime Instrumental, and the film board theme, Crawling King Snake, are by Eli Catlin, which you can find on SoundCloud. When the movie ends, Andy, our conversation begins. Amazon giveth, Andy. As Amazon always doeth. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go first on this one. You do it. Mm-hmm. Take it. Take the lead. This is uh, Scott wrote in uh, that it's missing the good songs. I loved the mm. musical on Broadway, but the movie cuts most of the good songs and turns the story into a screwball comedy. Too bad with this cast, it could have been nearly as good as the show. Which, if you haven't been paying attention. Thank goodness best day of my life comes in to comment. The movie came first. The movie is meant to be a screwball comedy. The musical is adapted from the movie. (laughs) See, that, Andy, is what happens when Amazon comes to the rescue. This channel, this community they built is designed to steer people in the direction of truth and light. You have to wonder, though, if the person who wrote the comment actually read that note that someone left for them or if they just comment and leave i i like to believe that they read it that they read it yes and that they printed it out and studied it and then they went back to watch the movie again and that it changed their opinion i like to think that every amazon commenter and, and reviewer has that level of investment in what they write on the internet yeah well i have another one star for you pete by james james what do you got And it's not even like James Space James. It's just James James, like one name, Um, who says, the worst film ever made? This has got to be one of the top contenders for worst film ever made. Phoned in acting from everyone, even the inimitable B. Lily. And one has to go a long way to make her look bad. There is basically, this person must be Canadian because clearly a fan of hers. 
There was basically no <laughs> script. Canadians. <laughs> no arc, no character development. It is simply a morose series of very tired gags that consistently fall flat. One can't even look at this as a spoof because spoofs by their very nature must be intelligent and clever comments on the real. What an obscene waste of money and talent. If you enjoy this film, you must either have an IQ of less than 30 or be dead. Wow. That's dead. vile. Why is there so much hate in Canada? Right? A lot of, I mean, so uh, thank goodness, again, investment in the Amazon, the rich tapestry that is the Amazon community. Uh, uh, Mr. Siegel writes, well, lots of people are dead or have low IQs. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, dear. Well, what are you going to do, Andy? What are you going to do? Thanks, Amazon. It's hard to believe that we've been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. You're telling me producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our originals page when shopping for books and movies we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great conversations. I was so excited for our big Star Trek film franchise series this season. All those movies adapted from Gene Roddenberry's original 1960s TV show. As a huge fan, I know that you geeked out over analyzing the adaptations. Absolutely. From the motion picture to the Kelvin timeline films, seeing the Enterprise crews on the big screen was a dream come true. Our list of source material isn't just all books and plays. We have the original series in our list of source material. You can rent the episodes to watch and enjoy and support the show in the process. For our Millennium Trilogy series, we covered films adapted from the original books that launched Lizbeth Salander, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, The Girl Who Played with Fire, and The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest. As much as I love Fincher's version, the original Swedish versions are the way to go. We also did our Die Hard series in Season 7. I can't believe Die Hard and Die Hard 2 were adaptations! Two of the greatest action movies ever. Well, one of them at least. The other is awfully fun, though. We revisited the classic Mary Poppins for our 1960s movie musical series. A spoonful of sugar always helps the medicine go down. Old Boy was intense for our Park chan Vengeance trilogy. And East of Eden and Giant were highlights of our James Dean series. And a fun time travel mind bender with predestination to cap things off. Find all the books behind these adaptations and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Dive into the source material for your favorite movies. Check it out today. Thenextreel.com slash originals. Originals.